So Dr. Gandhi has to go back to the CIFAR director's meeting. I don't. I don't. Oh, I'm don't? here. So we're <laughs> okay. So we're, we're, we're moderating. For a while. We're co-moderating this. You're not off the hook. <laughs> so uh, one thing to remember, though, about the molnupiravir combination uh, issue is that in order to make mistakes, you have to replicate. Uh, and so that uh, if you uh, look at combining it with a drug that inhibits replication, you may not actually see uh, synergistic effects or even additive effects. It could be antagonism. So we'll have to hmm. look at that and see how it, how it uh, plays out. We're joined now by Dr. Meredith Clement, who is uh, coming to us from New Orleans uh, and uh, is going to join us for this panel discussion. We're delighted to have you, Meredith. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Glad to be here. Thank you. And uh, we also have on the panel um, Roger, who's going to remain with us. And Connie Kellum is coming back. And uh, Connie Benson is coming back. And I think Dr. Raj Gandhi has to stay at the CIFAR meeting. Is that correct? OK. So the only confusion, we won't have to worry about the Gandhis. We'll have to worry about the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the East Coast variety. We're not going to have the East Coast variety. <laughs> okay. right. So that, that'll make the confusion easier. But there are a lot of questions coming in. OK. So let's, uh, do you want to get started with some of the questions there, Monica? Yes, there are a lot of STI questions, Connie. Um, I know. I it's exciting, that. yeah, to see these new guidelines. So, um, you know, I'll ask you, um, can you comment on STI prophylaxis with docs <laughs> if you're doing the definitive uh, study on it? I think because, because of the questions of the equipoise and, and the other concerns about risks and antibiotic resistance. So, would, would you recommend it now? Are you gonna say equipoise until the studies? Done? Yeah, I, it's a really good question. I, <clears throat> it's hard to answer that when you feel like there's enough equipoise that you need to do this study. Yeah. Um, I certainly would not recommend it widely. Um, I think there are, there are a handful of my patients who come to mind who have really frequent STIs. And I, I think there may be rare situations where um, if they're having STIs even be in between every three month uh, testing that that may be if they won't, if they can't join a study and you are really, and they're concerned, it's your chance of doing harm is probably not great. Um, but I think you really need to let them know that we really don't have data in HIV, persons living with HIV and we, um, it's not a it's not a guidance that has been recommended by um, normative body yet. Well, and and I'll add, Dr. Kellum, you were nice enough to chat with me way back when I think I was giving a talk about this, and and I talked to Dr. Molina also. And a lot of what you guys are evaluating is uh, changes in the microbiome and resistance data. So I think until we have more um, data related to those things, I, I you know I don't think it should be generally recommended. I will say here in New Orleans where we certainly have patients living with HIV or, or on PrEP um, who have very, very frequent STIs. Um, I've seen it done, uh, I guess not infrequently um, in those select situations um, sort of in, in the community here. And when we kind of discuss this in our um, among our LSU uh, ID physicians in, in our conferences, we have like half our group is very into STI clinical and treatment and research. And then the other half is antimicrobial stewardship um, <laughs> and infection control. And it kind of is this uh, butting heads of, of who supports it and who doesn't. And, you know, another question, and I'm, I'm just curious if you do this of GC test of care, because um, there is this, this question that's coming in, like how long after treatment? Right. Awesome. So I should I typed yeah. in the an answer um, yeah. before they got um, erased, but in case people didn't see it, it's really only recommended for pharyngeal GC and two weeks after treatment. And part of that is the antibiotic um, penetration into the oral pharynx is lower than in other sites. So it's not recommended for all sites, but just pharyngeal and soon after two weeks. And I have to say, I'm, I'm not... Meredith, is that something that you're doing in New Orleans? I'm, I don't think we're doing it in Seattle, but I think people are just yeah. um, waiting. We to... have, 
we so we I went the STI clinic um, and we have started doing it there. Um, and and we I think our we kind of tell folks 10 to 14 days with the caveat that it's a PCR test. So it might still um, be detecting some dead pathogen. And, and it's, I guess, a little hard to interpret. So we tend to wait more towards the two week um, period. Um, but yeah, since I guess December, whenever the new guidelines weren't released, but there was the preview, um, we've we've started doing that. One question that's come in is, do you do three site testing in, I mean, in a way, I think the question is for women, cisgender women. Right. Um, yeah, so. We, we, we don't routinely. I mean, I think that um, the way it's worded in the guidelines is to um, consider it um, based on exposure and in consultation with the, the patient. Um, and part of this, I think, is stemming from uh, you can get uh, chlamydial, uh, rectal chlamydia in heterosexual women who deny um, uh, anal sex. And, and so you might pick up additional uh, samples, but whether it's really uh, cost effective and how widely to do it, I, I don't think we have, um, have great guidance there. Meredith, what are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, we, we're doing um, just based on sites of exposure um, as reported by the, the patient um, in general. So I, I agree with you. One thing that we've been doing here for COVID is as we have vending machines, people can drop in and swab their noses and then drop the swab um, and get the result back um, in 12 hours or so as, as we do, as we're trying to monitor the campus. And some of our medical students saw that and got quite excited about it and said, why don't we put some vending machines out for STDs and do this with urine? Uh, what would uh, our two STD, STI, I'm sorry, uh, STIers think about, uh, about that? We had quite a discussion about it, still going on. Um, what do you see as risks, benefits, and concerns about um, uh, vending machines with um, uh, come and do it yourself STI uh, multiplex <laughs> testing for urine? Yeah, for urine well, specifically. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. I was just going to say I love the term vending machines to describe that, that approach, and I guess that's really what it is. Um, go go ahead, Dr. Kellum. No, no, I, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, well, so I think both um, kind of self testing, and then now there's a lot of uh, excitement about mail in kits. Um, and I think they've both um, been reported to be very kind of acceptable and feasible by patients. So my thought thought is kind of, you know, whatever the patient is willing to do um, to increase testing frequency and especially test when there are concerns, uh, i.e. symptoms, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, um, and so, yeah, and as far as self-collection, I mean, we know um, that that works. So I, I don't really have concerns there. I think if it can increase testing frequency, I think it's a valuable um, uh, platform. Sounds like a great pilot study for an ambitious student. <laughs> I think it should be called vending machine STI testing. I mean, I think yeah. one just maybe to add one thing is that if we really um, wanted to try to detect um, syphilis and diagnose syphilis, there yeah. is there are challenges with doing um, self collection of a you don't get enough sample with a DBS to be able to do an RPR and and do titers. But for gonorrhea and chlamydia, I think that it's an interesting idea. Here's our here's a vending machine since you were that we we have about uh, 30 of these around the campus and uh, it's really made it easy to get the uh, the rapid testing uh, uh, and frequent testing done but uh, they are trying to decide what color scheme should go on to the STI ones so <laughs> it looks great it really is the name. um I got a question from Dr. Christopher King saying he does street medicine and just contact me about the Ward 86, what we're doing with the injectables. You could just email me because it's pretty interesting. Um, say, Susan uh, Cohn, uh, that we, as the question is, although we haven't, this is to Roger, although we haven't seen the actual data from the INCAR study, I think all of us are emailing Joel Flavsky and saying, please, 
I did in the, I did a, a text of PI, but they they tight lipped. They I, I wanted to have at least. They're one very tight lipped. I, they're talking at uh, Joel because it's at UCSF, so he's talking at provider meeting yeah. on our mm -hmm. provider meeting in a week. But he said he's not going to tell us anything. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but he said uh, does it? But Susan Cohen is Dr. Does it support the routine use of routine anal pap smears in MSM? Mm -hmm. Uh, the challenge is to have a pathologist that is able to read it. And so we need to have setups where that can be done if, if effectively. Uh, uh, East Coast and West Coast, you guys have abilities to do that. Uh, here in the middle of the country, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to, to have the team, the in a surgeon, the pathologist, uh, to work together with us on, uh, on, on this. It's very exciting. And lots of STD questions again, because this is a good question. Like this question about neuros to both Meredith and Connie, but this question of, um, you know, someone who's having difficulty at being at home can't somehow do IV penicillin for neurosyphilis. So what do you think about middle ground um, yeah. daily injections? Yeah, or PO. Docs. I think it's, um, it's, it is feasible. You have to make arrangements like what we do at our um, HIV clinic is we have people come to the clinic for their daily um, 2.4 million units of uh, procaine pen and and they need to get probenicid um, 500 milligrams QID to uh, slow down renal excretion of penicillin. And that works fine. And then on the weekend, they have to come to urgent care to get that. You really don't want them to miss the weekend doses. So I think in a someone who can't, uh, won't uh, do be hospitalized or can't do a um, pump for IV pen G, it's, it's a reasonable alternative. And I personally, I would feel much more comfortable doing that because it's basically directly observed therapy than doxycycline. We just um, think, you know, you just don't know how well people are adhering to it. So I would strongly recommend trying to do the procaine pen over doxy. And I think that is listed as alternative in the guidelines as acceptable um, as opposed to doxy or septraxone kind of as alternate, but not preferred. And then the other thing I was just going to add is, you know, just to remember that um, with you, you alluded to this, Dr. Kellum, but the, the pump can be used. So like we admitted someone last week, he was in the hospital for less uh, maybe 24, 48 hours, got the pump and then was free to go. So it, mm. it's not that folks have to stay in the hospital for that full yeah. 10 to 15 days. Yeah. Thanks for, that's a really good point, Meredith. So Connie, ben, Dr. Benson, you looked up this question of M184V with this latrimer, because I know that you wrote and said that you now have the information. So <laughs> yes. You know, so, I have no uh, idea. And Roger also wrote an okay. answer to the to the individual who asked, but I just thought I'd comment on it from my talk since it came up. But uh, uh, Monica and I both said we did not expect the M184B mutation to have an impact on his latrivir activity. And the paper that demonstrates that, I can write an answer in the, in the chat that gives you that reference. But Islatrovir does select for the M184B mutation, but in contrast to 3TC and FTC, the occurrence of that mutation results in a greater than 500-fold reduction in activity uh, against the virus for 3TC and FTC, but only about a two- to three-fold reduction with Islatrovir. And in vivo, and in animal models, there has not been a selection for M184B or a reduction in activity of Islatrovir in, in any of the clinical trials. So we've not seen the emergence of that mutation with Islatrovir. And that has to do with the relatively higher uh, potency of Islatrovir against um, HIV-1, including those HIV-1 with an M184B mutation. So it should not have an impact. Binds so tightly, it seems. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Chip um, to 
my uh, reading and thank you. I now actually do have to go back to the CPAR driver's seat. Yeah, I, I knew it. See you okay, later. Okay, thank you. Thanks for being here today, Monica. Thank you. Talk thank you very much. Bye. Can I right. email you for your protocol also? Because that's yeah. Please do. I mean, it's it's like we watch them like hawks. I mean, we were doing this very, very gingerly, but but there's some patients that simply can't take orals. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, thank you. And okay. and one thing I, I was going to add, if it's okay, so the the person who wrote wanted the protocol for direct to inject, and so I just wanted to add that there there are good data from Flare. I think the 124, 144 week results, whichever was just published in Lancet HIV, where they a subset got direct to inject and had no hypersensitivity reactions or adverse effects. Efficacy safety was just as strong as the oral lead-in um, group. So I think there are, um, it's it does seem reasonable to to start doing that, I guess maybe I'm not supposed to talk about off-label, but um, if, you know, in, in certain situations. And then I, I just was going to add, too, that 083, some people may know this, but the Cabotegvir prep study um, will, the open-label extension is now making that oral lead-in optional. Um, and so we should have answers, um, you know, in the not-so-distant future about direct-to-inject in, in the prevention um, arena also. So there's a question, I guess, here that we could direct at uh, both um, Connie and Meredith about sexual uh, addiction issues and patients with the current STIs. Any issues, any way to get at some of that? Thoughts about that? Uh, that how, is how to define that. First of all, I'm not sure how we would define it. it it's, um, I think it's, I guess, the way I would answer that. And again, Meredith, please give your perspective. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to have a conversation with someone about what's what's going on. And I, you know, I think in the context of COVID, people went through, um, you know, we, many people made changes in their lives in the initial six months and did social distancing. And I think we saw this even in the Doxy Pep study that their sexual contact number went down. And then after things felt less um, scary, they they changed. So I think it's, I'm no expert into how to deal with people who have uh, sexual compulsivity, um, but for many of the people who I think that we're seeing uh, who have STIs, it's not that they're, um, I wouldn't call it sexual addiction, but they've been living with this specter of um, transmitting HIV or acquiring HIV for so long and that they now are experiencing that um, freedom that they wanted, which is uh, to not have, um, to not feel like they have to use condoms. So I would need to get input from someone who has a lot more experience in um, diagnosing and uh, treating people with sexual addiction, but I, I don't, I think it's a minority. It's not really the majority. Yeah, and I, I'm trying to pull back from like med school, like how to define addiction and, you know, in the setting of substance use. But I think it has to do with like when a behavior becomes problematic for you and others around you. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I think the rising tide of STI certainly is problematic for from a public health standpoint. But I don't know for these individual um, patients that we're seeing with frequent STIs, if they're uh, sexual activity is problematic to them. And in fact, it's probably the opposite. So I, you know, I, I think, but it, I do think it's an important point and it's probably worth talking to some of our patients about, um, you know, the, you know, presence of sexual um, addiction or compulsive behavior, compulsive behavior. So. so there's still questions over here, but I think we did address the doxycycline question. Do you all feel that's been addressed appropriately or do you want to address it some more? No, I think that was a carry okay. forward. Yeah. I think, yeah, and um, three side testing you've talked about, and the uh, uh, rupilverine uh, or uh, the cabotegravir uh, protocol is in the mail. So uh, I think we've cleared out the questions and answers. Are there any other questions and answers people would like to ask us today or comments they'd like to make about things you heard or uh, advice you have for us or others? Well, I'd like to ask Roger a question. Just, uh, I know you had a, a rapid tour de force through a number of different topics in your talk, and it was really, really spectacular. 
Um, what is your favorite approach to people who are worried about weight gain with antiretroviral therapy? And how do you counsel them? Yeah, uh, um, it's a very difficult uh, thing. <clears throat> Number one, I think, is candle. Uh, allow, uh, admitting to them that we know there is a potential and that there are correlates with uh, 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 race, ethnicity, gender, um, but it is, uh, it, it, it's not, <clears throat> well, but there's no good predictors. So uh, the great majority of people don't gain weight, and, but there is a small minority that gain a lot of weight. So averages doesn't re don't really help in, in looking at weight gain in HIV because that's all that the studies give us averages at that. Uh, this is small, uh, we all have uh, people who have gained 30, 40 pounds, and while the large majority of people in that clinic don't get any. I think that's a good perspective to have uh, to give uh, people and then to tell them that we do not know about reversibility. Data is emerging, but we don't know yet. And so I would just worry about losing the patient's confidence and the adherence if I don't disclose <laughs> this uh, uh, at the outset. And uh, I probably, uh, getting a little uh, more reluctant to uh, give uh, 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 INST, especially with TAF, to a, a, a Black woman whose uh, who's BMI is 35, because in advance, if you look at the magnitude of weight, BMI gain was really higher than what weight gain on average is in the U.S., and this is a 99% uh, African-American population, and and baseline weight being high and, and, and being female uh, uh, a predictor. So I'm beginning to consider that that may not be the best option for them, but I, of course, this is departing from current guidelines, <laughs> which I'm loath to do. So no great answer, I'm afraid. And then a follow-on, and maybe Meredith can comment on this too in her practice. The When you have somebody who has had substantial weight gain, do you switch them? And if you do, what do you switch them to? Uh, yeah, I, I do have a number of, um, I guess, uh, cisgender female African-American patients who I have, can think of one off the top of my head who has gone from 100 to 200 pounds. Mm. And her, her BMI was very low. I mean, part of this is definitely a return to health phenomenon. Um, and then another patient who's gained at least 50 to 60 and um, I tried switching the patient who'd gained 50 pounds. The, the one who'd gained 100 did not want to switch. The one who'd gained 50 to 60, I switched her, um, I believe. I mean, I, mean, I don't know that uh, this is evidence-based, right? But to a, a darunavir-based regimen, but she had side effects and wanted to go back to um, BIC, TAF, FTC. So I... Um, I, I don't. I don't think I've had any success, and I, I don't actually think there's great data to say. Right, is that Dr. Bedimo that you were saying um, that would support switching? But you know, you, you try, right? Yeah. yeah. There are case reports now, um, and probably favored agents are going to be newer NNRTI-based regimens uh, that do not yeah. come with path. And we can't wait for ACTG uh, 51 to enroll. And fortunately, it's already so slowly. And we, we, uh, this data is sorely uh, awaited. Another thing that I hope we get very soon is uh, uh, more mechanistic uh, uh, <clears throat> data and also predictors. If we had a biomarker that in, in early in the therapy can tell you leptin, adiponectin, whatever, that this person is likely to gain weight, that would be clinically very relevant, but we don't have that yet. So the question's popped up here about Agrifta. Anybody have any experience with it and uh, access that? Well, the, this, um, we have seen uh, some data with decreasing uh, central obesity, unfortunately has to maintain administration of the drug or it will rebound, that's number one. And then uh, there has been newer data now on liver fat. I believe personally, again, that is my own opinion, that if we do have good evidence of, of, on decreasing hepatic adiposity, would be a, a better uh, a argument. <clears throat> okay. And um, Roger, how about uh, 
metformin, I, I thought there were, were maybe some data that of its benefit in the setting of HIV. I, I tend to use it sort of aggressively in patients with prediabetes um, in, in my clinic and talk to them about, you know, uh, benefit with weight in kind of the, you know, double benefit, I guess. Um, but I, I'd be curious what you're doing. Yeah, well, I don't really use it for that purpose, but it's the, 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 the number one uh, go-to in, in, uh, uh, for diabetes in uh, people living with HIV in our clinic. And um, I think it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, a safe, uh, it's a safe drug and we, we can uh, move on to others after that. But I don't have good data on whether, how, whether and, or how much that would help <laughs> with the weight. <clears throat> I just caution people also to, I don't know if it's a PC term, but not don't throw the baby out of the bathwater and uh, don't, uh, the, the integrase based regimens are still recommended for most, as they say in the DHHS uh, guidelines. And, and uh, you have to have good reasons to use something that is uh, either less effective or less well tolerated. No, you can, we don't have any pediatricians today, so you're okay with that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think we've actually expanded the, uh, uh, we've gone through the questions and we've had really a great discussion. It's been really a great morning and uh, early afternoon and we appreciate everybody's attention and the, uh, the fantastic presentations and engagement of all the panelists. And uh, we really look forward to doing this again. Please stay tuned for more IES USA activities. And we'd love to hear comments and suggestions about how we can improve on what we do and things you'd like to see us do. Uh, and uh, look forward to uh, more interactions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Happy, ha happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.